Hello everyone, today we're going to be talking with Ms. Samantha Greenberg. We're going to be discussing hedge funds. So uh, would you like to maybe introduce yourself? Great. Thanks everyone for taking the time. I'm Samantha Greenberg. I've been an investor in technology, media, and consumer companies for 20 years. Uh, most Currently I work at a firm called Citadel LLC, one of the largest investment management firms in the world. I, I grew up in Pennsylvania in a small town with only 14,000 people. Everyone in my family is, sorry, I'm gonna mute uh, everyone. Everyone in my family is a math person, but no one else works in finance. My sister is an economist, dad is tax lawyer, mom a math teacher. So I've been interested in investing and markets since I was a little kid. Uh, my family likes to tell the story about when I was in second grade, you can stay inside at our beach house and watch what's today CNBC and watch tickers go across the screen um, and, and look up stocks and, and write them down. And so, and at by high school, I was re economics was my favorite class, was reading deal books. Uh, and so, and following news about mergers and transactions in the news, I knew I wanted to go into finance. And so I applied early decision to Wharton School at University of Pennsylvania, became a finance major and went to work at business and later went to business school at Stanford University. And so just to wrap up, I've worked in, in the investing industry now for 20 years. And I just, I have a passion for investing that runs so deep. I truly can't imagine doing anything else. Um, I find happiness and fulfillment doing deep dive research into companies, technologies, industry trends. And so if you remember one thing about the, this conversation, I would advise any young person that in order to be successful in your career path, you need to figure out you know, what it is that you love and you need to choose a profession and an industry that you truly love. A professor of mine once said that work should be more fun than fun. That won't be true 100% of the time, but the best way to succeed is to love what you do and find a way and find it you know, fun to do your job. Awesome. Thank you for the great advice and introduction. So I guess we'll get started with the basic questions. Um, how did you get involved in the hedge fund industry, right? You said you were interested in finance. So how did you, you know, end up working in hedge funds? Yeah, it's a great question. So as we talked about, I, I loved stocks, had been interested in investing since I was a little kid. Uh, by the time I was in graduate school at Stanford Business School, I by then had had my own brokerage account for years where I do just in my spare time, my own research, buying stocks in my personal account. So I thought, you know, I love doing this. I'd probably love investing as a job and a career, not just a hobby. I tried a summer internship in the investing world during business school and I loved it. And that was a particularly interesting summer because it was, and this goes to why the hedge fund industry, it was summer of 2002. And so the world had just come off of a market meltdown in following the internet.com bubble. And in summer of 2002, there were many companies who turned out to be engaged in accounting fraud. The rules have since, since then there's been regulation, but that year was Enron, Adelphia, Tyco, WorldCom, just a crazy summer where we saw companies engaged in real fraud. So I thought, um, not only do I want to work in investing where I'm investing behind companies I think will win, and I also want to be able to kind of bet against the bad guys, which is something, you know, bet against companies that I think will go down. And so a good way to do that is to enter the hedge fund industry. So coming out of graduate school, I entered the hedge fund industry and I'm still here 18 years later. All right, so that was one level of specialization. Let's talk about the next level of specialization. How did you come to, you know, become an expert in technology, media, and telecom, which is where I believe you are um, you know, most experienced? Yes. Uh, I've always been fascinated by technology and innovation. Um, when I first graduated from college, I worked in investment banking at Goldman Sachs, and I mostly worked on technology mergers. It became, you know, at that point, such a passion that as I moved into investing, I, I stuck with that industry. Awesome, awesome. It's good to follow your passions and turn interest into an actual job. So what inspired you to start your own hedge fund? Was it just the same or 
you know, what's the difference between working in one and starting your own? So it's such a good question. So I've, along with investing, I, I love the idea of building a business and I've loved entrepreneurship and business building since the beginning of my career. I actually left investment banking to go work in technology private equity at a firm called Francisco Partners, which today is a huge technology private equity firm. When I joined, it was a year before we had even launched the first fund. All of us sat in like one little room together on Sand Hill Road in Silicon Valley and had the chance to help build the entire firm. And that was, that was something, an exciting experience that had always stayed with me. Stanford Business School is very focused on entrepreneurship. And so the decision to start my own firm, after I'd been in the hedge fund industry for 13 years, I had been promoted to partner at a very large hedge fund. And by that point, after you know, 13 years experience investing, deploying capital, being promoted into senior leadership, it had always been my dream to build my own investing process and culture the way I think, the way I felt it should be done. And so, you know, that was, kind of when I seize the opportunity. Awesome, awesome. So um, how exactly do hedge funds work, right? What investing methods do they employ? Is it just, you know, short and long positions? Or are there a lot more things that we need to be aware of? Yeah, it's a great question. So a hedge fund is an investment partnership. There's a pool of money that investors contribute, and that pool of money is managed by a professional manager, or the hedge fund manager. The goal of a hedge fund is to maximize profits, or what we would call investment returns, and to minimize the risk or the volatility associated with that return. Most hedge funds also try to achieve what's called absolute returns, which means that a hedge fund seeks to make money whether markets are good or bad, like whether markets are going up or down. Uh, the biggest difference between a hedge fund and a mutual fund, which most people are familiar with, is hedge funds are generally not registered with the SEC, the Securities and Exchanges Commission. And because of that, they are not subject to as many rules and regulations as mutual funds. Because of that, hedge funds can employ more complicated investment strategies, they can use borrowed money, and they're generally considered, because of those things and the more flexible mandate, riskier assets. So because they're considered riskier assets, they can only be sold to carefully defined categories of investors who are considered sophisticated investors. Today, the hedge fund industry manages over $3 trillion of assets. Wow, that's a, that's a lot of money. So hedge funds are known to be pretty risky, right? Like you just mentioned. Um, how do they actually mitigate this risk? How do they um, you know, make sure to protect investors while still getting these great returns? Yeah, so great question. I also realized I forgot to answer your question about what investing methods hedge funds re employ. And so hedge funds in, can invest in all different kinds of assets. The hedge fund strategy that I work in is called long and short equity. Equity, equities or equity is another word for stocks. When you, so long equity means buying a stock. Uh, a hedge fund manager would go long a stock or buy a stock because the manager's research leads the manager to believe that the stock will go up over time. A short, shorting a stock is when a manager borrows a stock that they don't own, sells that stock, and they do that because they believe, based on their research, that the stock's price will fall um, based on bad expected bad performance of the company or other bad news expected from the company. And that will cause the stock price to go down, at which time the manager would buy the stock back at a lower price and return it. So long short equity, which is the strategy um, that that I work in and one of the bigger strategies within hedge fund investing simply means buying stocks that you expect to increase in value and shorting stocks you expect to decline in value. And so to your question about how do hedge funds mitigate risks, again, again, because hedge funds aren't subject to the same rules as mutual funds, they one of the things hedge funds can do to try to manage risk is um, well, they actively hedge, which simply means reducing exposure to risks ma the manager doesn't want 
A very common example of hedging is shorting, which we just talked about. Um, the types of risks a hedge fund manager might look to reduce their exposure to could be the risk of the stock market going down, the risk of a particular industry, or the risk of like something macro, something um, a macroeconomic circumstance, like a trade war with China or or like the pandemic. And so, um, let me give you an example. Let me give a real let, an example of risk mitigation. So let's pretend that I want to buy Snapchat stock because I think Snapchat has a strong lineup of new products coming out, and you know I think the stock is going up. If I only want exposure to Snapchat's own company specific products, but I don't want exposure to Snapchat's industry, which is the internet industry, one thing I could do would be to buy Snapchat and then short a different internet industry company. Let's just use Pinterest as an example. Um, and then what I'm capturing there is I don't have the risk of the internet industry, I just have the risk that Snapchat's products and business will perform better than Pinterest. Another way I could, I might look to hedge my risk is I could buy Snapchat, but I could say, okay, I love the internet industry. I think that the business is going really well. I just don't want exposure to the stock market. And so then I could have a short against the stock market with a long in Snapchat. And then I do have exposure to Snapchat's products to their industry, but not to the market going down. Oh, sorry. We're, oh, you're on mute. Um, I'm oh, not that's able to hear you. There. Go ahead. You're good. No, we can't hear what you're saying. Oh. Uh, Is it just I me, think, Ben? I think, his, or? I think his connection's having an issue. Um, so. Okay, well, I think Rahul was going to ask me who can invest in hedge funds. Is it can a normal investor invest in it? Is it reserved for wealthier investors? Um, and so, what I would say to that is the way to think about it is regulators in most countries, including the United States, set up guidelines when it comes to financial firms that are intended to protect people. And so those guidelines in the United States require that an investor has some level of market and investment expertise in order to invest in the hedge fund industry. Um, and those are usually measured by an experience threshold and an income threshold in order to invest in a hedge fund. So you can think of it as a consumer protection framework where the regulator, the United States regulatory agency is trying to protect investors from complex financial instruments and make sure that invest only investors who understand the financial instruments are investing. Um, the majority of investors in the hedge fund industry, like the private equity industry, are what's called institutional investors, which are companies like pension funds or university endowments. And so with this, there's not like a, there's not like a test that you have to pass. You do you apply to it as if it was through the SEC. Um, and yeah. So you certify, so you attest to your level of income or your level of assets. And that is, and that is the threshold. Um, and so a natural question would be, you know, do it since one of the most exciting themes I think of this decade is democratization of investing in general. A good a good question to ask is, will hedge fund investing be more democratized in the future? And so I do think technology and innovation will democratize hedge fund investing like it has with other kinds of investing. And like I said, just in general, one of the things I'm most excited about this decade is this idea of the democratization of investing. We've seen so much technology and innovation to make investing easy to use, like Robinhood, which is app-based, very easy to use, or slices of stock ownership, where if you love Tesla's stock, but one share costs $690, you can own like a $5 slice of Tesla's stock. And so all of these innovations are bringing young people who didn't used to be investors into the market. Um, Schwab, for example, talks about how today 35% of trades are done by under 40 year olds. If you look back just two years ago, it was less than 17%. And just last thing on this, 
one of the areas I'm personally very excited about is, is a new category called social investing, which takes investing and adds a social network or a social graph overlay. It's companies like eToro or public.com. And the idea is you and all of your friends um, are on this network. You can all see what each other are trading and doing, and you can talk about those investments, um, and you can follow people whose trades you admire and actually copy their trades and trade alongside of them. So I think that's I'm invested in several of those companies. I think this trend of social investing will be something exciting over the next few years. Would you say that the I so a lot of a lot of social media um, organizations like Reddit that house these very large communities um, of traders? Would you say that their ability to um, reach such a, a large network of people might affect a stock negatively um, or your investment? Because if you had um, a short on GameStop and then Wall Street Bets decides to pump it up because they can all view what each other is trading and you lose a ton of money, would you say that maybe in that case social investing wouldn't be as good? So it's, it's a really good question, Ben. And actually, you're right. So. One thing we've seen is there are certain stocks, whether it's meme stocks or other stocks where retail investors, and that could be people who are on Reddit or just individual people as opposed to companies, in some stocks are 40% of the flows. Whereas on average across the market, they're only 17% of trading flows. So if you think about when like individuals who may or may not, like who are all together on a social network comprise that much volume, on a stock, it absolutely has the effect of impacting the stock price. Difficulties, it's just been a rough day. So which question were we on? Um, so we were about to talk through um, the differences between long and short equity investments. Uh, I think we mostly covered it. I'll just say that, you know, again, a short equity investment is when you borrow a stock that you don't own, sell that stock, hoping the stock price goes down based on your research, and then you buy it back at a lower price and return it. And so, and so um, the only other thing to point out is sometimes you might short a stock, not just because you think it's actually a bad company, not for the reason that you think it's a bad company, instead because there's some risk in your portfolio that you just want a little protection against. So a good example might be, let's pretend that I own a lot of video game stocks. And so I want some protection. Um, I'm very positive on my video game stocks. Let's pretend I own Roblox and Activision, which makes Call of Duty. But I'm worried that as we're coming out of the pandemic, as people go back to work, go back to school, they'll spend less time with video games. And so I want a little protection against that industry risk that video engagement goes down temporarily. One thing I could do is find a video game stock that I don't necessarily think is a bad company. I might think is a good company, but I just think it won't go up as much as, as Activision and Roblox in this example. So let's pretend I short Electronic Arts, which makes FIFA and Madden, I might think that's a good company and the stock is going up, but I, but because it, I don't believe it will go up as much as Activision and Roblox, it protects me if the industry goes down for one reason or another. Let's say there's like a law that comes out in the US restricting video games. Uh, I have some protection against the industry risk. Um, and so that would be an example of there's times where you short a stock where you don't actually think the stock price will go down. You just are protecting against some other risk in your portfolio and think it won't go up as much as the stocks you own. So basically like an insurance policy for stocks. That's a, that's a great way to think about it. All right. So um, while I was you know, unable to connect, did we already go over um, you know, accredited investors and you know, just all of that we we did okay we went, okay yeah, exactly. great thank you so then in that case we'll just move on to the next question as a specialist in the consumer sector how do you think the american economy and just you know spending in general will bounce back from the effects of the pandemic yeah great question 
I think we'll see a much stronger resurgence in consumer spend than people expect, especially in categories like travel and live events, concerts, sports events, et cetera. Um, I think the pandemic you know, caused us all to understand how fragile life is. And economics theory shows that people spend more when they think the end of existence or the end of the world, and it's a little morbid, but is, is imminent. Uh, a really good example is if you look back at the 1920s. So the US had just endured a world war that claimed millions of lives and a pandemic that claimed millions more. People really felt having survived both of those catastrophic times that they wanted to take advantage of having survived and they spent more in the 1920s than had ever happened before. It was, so it was called the Roaring Twenties. Um, so we've seen, we know in the past that prior pandemics have been followed by big consumer spending binges. And there's reason to think that this pandemic, that the spending boom that follows it will be much more pronounced than anything we've ever seen before because of actions that the government and that our central bank, the Fed took during the pandemic, which added to household wealth. So think about it like just the stimulus bill that was passed by Congress in March, plus the one in December, sent a trillion dollars just in direct aid to people, setting aside like the aid that was sent to businesses. Um, and also during the long months of shelter in place, people's spend went down a lot because we couldn't go anywhere. And so the combination of all of that means actually U.S. households have saved $1.7 trillion just in the last 12 months. And so you can already see this mini explosion as we reopen and pent up demand. Las Vegas casinos are 95% occupied already on weekends. Um, and that's with you know, only 20% of the U.S. vaccinated Airline flights are running only 6% below the number of flights that were operating in 2019, the year before the pandemic. And when you look at forward travel reservations for later this year, like October, November, December, they're tracking to up double digits above 2019. So again, like pre-pandemic, of course, things will be up more than last year because it was down so much, but even more than kind of before the pandemic. So for all those reasons, I'm very bullish on what consumer spend will look like coming out of the pandemic. And just as kind of like a follow-up question, do you think this is limited to just, um, let's say, uh, travel and hospitality, or do you think it extends beyond just those key uh, sectors as well? So that's a really good, that is a really good question, and it's a very hotly debated topic. So I think there is some, the, the stock up spend, you know, I don't think we'll continue to grow. So money people spend on buying six months worth of toilet paper or food for their dog or like those, you won't see continued growth. Um, on the other hand, there was also a huge amount of money spent on home furnishings and consumer electronics because as people were stuck at home, they made their houses nicer. But because we're seeing a continued some kind of lingering effects of the pandemic, a de-urbanization, people moving out of cities, people uh, shifting towards hybrid work, where instead of going back to work five days a week, they go to an office two or three days a week, work from home. So those things, plus the combination of how much money has saved, will likely also boost even categories that did well last year, like electronics and home furnishing. That's good to know, that's good to know. And what do you think will be some of the most important technology and consumer investing themes over the next few years? Um, okay, so I'll just I'll just name a few that would hopefully be interesting to this audience as teenagers. So one of the biggest trends I think we'll see over the next several years is just the idea of the convenience economy and the on-demand economies. We all you know, really saw, whether it's through DoorDash or Uber Eats, like we all got used to this idea of press a button, your food's there in an hour. I think, and um, I think eventually that'll go far beyond food and groceries and alcohol and will extend to basically every retail category. You can already go on Instacart. If, you, if your AirPods break, um, Instacart will deliver you AirPods from Best Buy within an hour. I think over the next several years, you will just see this battle for who's going to win the last mile. And um, like I said, every retail purchase will eventually be to live, be part of this convenience economy. I also think trends around exercising at home like Peloton and Mirror or just 
classes at home and telemedicine. Um, yes, people will go back to going to their workout classes in gyms outside of their home, but I think some of those behaviors will stick because we've all seen how much easier they are. Oh, sorry. And then um, uh, my another, like the biggest trend is just, so is the importance of Gen Z, like generation Gen Z's coming of age and what that means for investing. And so if you think about like how big of a cohort your generation is by 2030, which will come before you know it in nine years, Gen Z's will be 27% of global income. And by 2031, they'll be the single largest holders of income of any demographic. And so basically what Gen Z wants will be the single most important thing you can invest in. And so there's things that are very, Gen Z we know from survey work, et cetera, are very different of a cohort than millennials. Um, first, they came of age or you all came of age in a decade of rights movements. And so in particular, one of the areas I think is really interesting is around climate change investing, whether it's electric vehicles, vertical farming, decarbonization, meal, meat alternatives. Um, I think all of these will be a really exciting category. Um, the other thing, been an investor in video games for 18 years. It's one of my favorite investing areas. Uh, and a, a fact I find fascinating about Gen Zers is uh, you're all called the loneliest generation, which means actually 40% of Gen Zers will report that they would rather hang out with their friends online than, than be with them in person. Um, even before COVID, 60% of US teenagers kind of after school and outside of school on weekends spent time just on their interactions with their friends were online as opposed to getting together in person. And so I think investing opportunities around video games, around esports, particularly around the blurring of lines between social networks and video gaming, and also this idea, whether it's Roblox or Fortnite or Discord of a third place where you spend your time, um, not necessarily even, it's, and it's a combination of gaming, social, watching others game, talking, having live experiences. Um, those to me are all really fascinating investment themes. Gen Z is also the first generation that watches more esports than actual traditional sports. So 21% of Gen Zers watch esports weekly, only 18% watch traditional sports weekly. Um, and then just thinking through other things, I think 5G networks is a really interesting investment theme because in particular, because 5G networks have significantly lower latency which facilitates businesses around autonomous vehicles, robotics, artificial intelligence, and AI. And then, you know, maybe the last theme I'd mention on the opposite side of Gen Z is longevity tech. And so by 2030, in addition to Gen Z being 27% of the world's income, the U.S. will be one of 44 what's called super-aged countries, meaning more than more than one in every five people will be above age 65. There'll be a lot of boomers walking around. And so there will be, if you think about the investment implications of that, um, some of the areas we think are interesting are around senior care automation. So there's these senior care robots that hug old people <laughs> um, or around people will, uh, people will work longer since they're living longer. So reskilling, digital learning, um, just all the different business models based on longe longevity tech. So mostly it's around stay becoming even more comfortable just at home, uh, video games, and then old people. <laughs> exactly. Uh, what an interesting time. Um, so yeah, that's actually the end of our prepared questions. So I'll hand it off to Ben now so that we can go through the questions that our audience submitted. Yeah. So um, to start us off, um, we spoke heavily on gaming and things like that. Um, what are your opinions on, um, and you mentioned Roblox and Discord in specific, which is ones that I also had questions about. Um, both of those companies are more um, one product companies. You know, um, Roblox has just Roblox, the game. And obviously they have different things that you can inside the game, but it's still just Roblox. And Discord makes most of its revenue through um, Discord Nitro because they don't run ads. Um, so what are your opinions on these companies? I mean, obviously they're gonna have um, a big position in the gaming space, 
but it doesn't seem like they have many different forms of revenue. Yes. Okay. So let's start with Discord because that is a really good point. So to make a comparison to Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg, one of the ways they built their business is they just, they have a belief rightly or wrongly that you build the audience first and then you monetize the audience because it's much harder to build a huge community than it is to find ways to get money from them. And so there used to be this rule of thumb, like let's get to a billion users before we even try to monetize. And so I think you see a lot of that with Discord. They have 140 million monthly users. 70% of their users actually use them not just for game. It, it is definitely the primary use case is gaming, but 70% of users are using them for non-gaming conversations in addition to gaming. And so if you think about, you're right, Discord Nitro is definitely a monetization driver. Um, also in that a kind of, there's, it's a freemium model. So there's you know, one layer of personalization that's free. After that, if you wanna buy custom emotes or avatars or server boosts. So there's all kinds of in-app purchases that you can make. Um, but the way, if, if Discord wanted tomorrow, what I'm trying to say is the hardest thing is to build the user base they've built and like the stickiness and the passion of how many people use Discord and how much time they spend. Um, if they wanted to, for example, have advertising, the They'll do like Discord did 130 million of revenue last year. They'll probably do around 250 million this year, 400 million next year. If they were offering advertising instead of having, you know, instead of doing 250 million of revenue this year, they could add another 500 million of revenue. And so I think with Discord, again, a lot of it is the idea of believing that they're going to build the community first, monetize it later. Um, so, and so with Roblox, it's different. You're right. It's only, um, it's one game, but the way, but they would say it is also about, again, these blurring of lines between gaming and social networks. And so people, the vision is over time, just like something like 12 million people watch the marshmallow concert on Fortnite, you know, all at the same time. The idea is like, you'll have your birthday party on Roblox. There'll be all these live events and experiences on Roblox. And actually like a thing that is, that I have to give, that blows me away a stat about Roblox is, so the average user, monthly user of Roblox is spending 152 minutes a day on Roblox, that's more than like a console user, like a PlayStation or an Xbox user. They spend about 150 minutes playing kind of everything they'll play in the day on PlayStation and Xbox. So the engagement and the passion for Roblox is like is shockingly amazing. Um, they only, if you think their audience, and I'm not saying I think this, but if you define their audience as people aged six years old to 24, so right now 55% of their users are under age 13. So we can have a debate on you know, who we think is their addressable audience. But in the countries they, that Roblox is offered in where they do local language, they're only penetrating 6% of people aged six to 24. So yeah, I, I understand what you mean by um, the freemium model and growing their community because I've been using Discord since I think I signed up January 2nd of 2017. Wow. Um, and so just from personal experience, I, I love the, the company and I love their product um, and I use it every day, but I, I haven't seen, as you said, freemium, I haven't seen a need to ever pay for their premium services. You know, their, their base, their base service is so good that I would think that one would never really need to pay for the premium, but if they grow their community like that by offering such a good product, then they could monetize it. All right. So um, next one. So you earlier you spoke about um, immense spending after um, wars and pandemics and things like that. And that was clear in um, after World War Two, I believe the GDP went up about 30 percent um, mm -hmm. or it might have been during to the end. Um, but that was because the need for Europe to repair um, all their cities. And so they went to the U.S. for production, things like that. Um, so how would you say GDP will be um, will be affected after the pandemic? 
Um, and what would you say is the biggest driving factor? Yeah. So, you know, so we will likely see at least kind of high single digit increase in GDP this year, which is you know, the most significant economic growth we've seen since 2009 to 2010, exiting the financial crisis. Um, and the driver of that growth will be primarily consumer spend, uh, but you will certainly, you're certainly seeing continued corporate spend. So even though consumer spend, as we talked about households have saved $1.7 trillion over just over the last 12 months between stimulus money and spending going down, um, companies have also, because employees aren't traveling, uh, people are working remotely, so you don't have a lot of the in-office expense, companies have saved a lot of money too. And so, uh, as, so as companies start to bring people back to the office, resume corporate travel, resume the kind of tech projects that they had had to put on hold. So if you're doing like a huge implementation of a software product that was put on, those kinds of things were shelved during the pandemic. Okay. So, um, a while ago, um, Rahul and I spoke to um, CEO of Top Tier Capital, um, David York, um, also a hedge fund manager, and he was speaking about the um, the unicorn era um, of hedge fund investment, um, especially in Silicon Valley. How it was it was kind of slowing down a little bit. Um, what is what is your opinion on that? So, when you do you mean investing in private companies that are unicorns that are over a billion dollars in valuation? Um, not necessarily. I, he spoke mainly about um, just these companies that it was almost guaranteed success on an investment um, coming out of the Silicon Valley boom. Okay. Uh, so, so I think that the pace of innovation you know, we're seeing today definitely exceeds anything we've seen in, in the past. Um, and I think there's also, there's more of a sophisticated understanding of technology business models and a willingness in the public markets uh, to invest in earlier stage companies. So I don't know how much for this discussion people know about SPACs, uh, but the SPAC market is when a financial investor uh, raises money from investors and then finds a company to buy and brings it public. And what we're seeing, the sweet spot of that market is earlier stage companies than kind of we've historically seen go public before. So the rule of thumb used to be that before you would see an IPO of a company, they might have 200 or 300 million in sales. You're now seeing companies that have kind of sub 100 million in sales come public through SPACs. So it does seem like the willingness of public markets to embrace earlier stage, very high growth, but kind of less proven out models um, is far ahead of where we were a few years ago. So you're you're bullish on lots of innovation, correct? Yes. Okay. So what is what is your personal opinion on um, innovation funds um, such as those ran by Kathy Woods of Arc? Oh, um, so I haven't done I haven't specifically analyzed. ARC's funds enough to have a view specific to ARC, but what I can say is what uh, Kathy Wood has done, again, is one of the things I love about these social investing companies is the idea of putting together thematic portfolios where, again, investing is democratized because anyone, they're, they're set up in mutual fund structures or in smart portfolio structures where anyone can invest in them. And so I do think what she, you know, has made very famous through her ARC Innovation Funds is something we will see a lot of going forward. Again, if you look on some of the social investing brokerage platforms, they might have all different themes, whether it's space commercialization or climate change, uh, and you can just invest in a smart por portfolio that's put together on those brokerage platforms. And again, it's just a mutual fund that anyone can invest in. So I think she has really started a trend that is here to stay in different forms, although I can't speak to, you know, what all like 
you know, the, I don't know her funds well enough to have an opinion of them specifically. Okay. Um, this next question is more career oriented. It was, um, do you think the management consultant route or the investment banking route is best to prepare for a career in private equity? Well, so um, you guys are going to hate this answer. I would say they're both excellent ideas. Some of the best venture capitalists out there came from consulting um, because in consulting, you really deeply get to understand strategy and problem solving for businesses. And so if you want to invest in particular in earlier stage companies where what they will value in an investing partner is someone who can help them through transitions, help them build the company, make the right hires, you know, get from a place of being very early to more mature, um, then consulting is kind of the perfect way to embark on a career in investing. So, and, and that would also be true, not just for venture capital, but also for private equity, because in private equity, you're buying the entire company and then you're going to operate it. So people who've done strategy consulting really have exceptional skill at that operating side of the business. Um, investment banking is perfect training if you want to go into a hedge fund where you're analyzing public companies, where the analytical skills, the um, building company models, understanding how to look at all the different business drivers of a company, um, that's, a ver that's the most, one of the most important skills in hedge fund investing. And so a simplistic answer, so they're both perfect, you know, they're both amazing choices right out of college that will position you well for a career in investing. If your passion is for something like private equity or venture capital, I would say consulting. And if your passion is to go for, to a hedge fund investment bank. Okay. And so what you mean by consulting is just companies like uh, McKinsey and Company? Exactly. McKinsey, Bain, BCG, Boston Consulting Group, um, Strategy Consulting, Jobs. Okay. Um, so I think what we're going to do is open it up to um, live audience questions. Um, mm -hmm. And so I will let Rahul take it from here um, with regards to that. Great. But, um, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ben. All right, so now we'll open it up for you guys to ask any of your questions. So, you know, feel free to just ask out loud directly um, or, you know, drop it in the chat. Or if you really want to, you know, be on the down low, you can send it to us through the private message. So let's see some of those questions. Um, I believe uh, Isha had one. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Sometimes my mic doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so um, I actually had a question about water stocks that were kind of newly introduced in 2021, right? So um, considering like the USA economy and its population, do you think it's something people will invest in or should invest in, I guess, in terms of its newness and like sort of diversity to your portfolio? It's yeah, it's a great question. So I have not specifically looked at the water stocks that you're mentioning. What I can say is along the lines of how we talked about how I think climate change or climate change investing is going to be one of the most important broader categories of investing over this decade. And I tossed out a few examples like electric vehicles, decarbonization, vertical farming, et cetera. Um, along those lines, water scarcity is one of the biggest climate problems. And so I would imagine that there's going to be a lot to do around the area you're talking about, but I just haven't specifically looked at the companies to offer an opinion on them. Got it. Thank you very much. Thank you. One of the questions that came through the chat is, are there any ways for high school students to get an internship in the hedge fund industry? Yeah. Um, so you don't see it often. Uh, it's generally mostly college students. And so the best avenue is likely going through your personal networks. If you know someone that works for a hedge fund or if there's there are some organizations that place high school students in internships in the investment management industry, including with hedge funds. 
uh, or reaching out to the human resource department of hedge funds to ask if they would ever, you know, take a, a high school student. I mean, you, you don't, I haven't come across it often. The industry hires a lot of college summer interns, but you know, anyone, I think if, if you're scrappy enough to try to, where you know people, uh, one of the things I was very impressed by actually speaking of high school, a close family friend of mine, when I was running my own firm said, you know, hey, listen, I'm going to college. He was going to Emory in a year, he was a junior in high school, um, wanted to apply to Emory in the fall, ultimately wound up going there. But he said, I'll just come in, I'll work for free. And anyway, he would, we wouldn't let him work for free because I just felt that that was you know, wrong for an investing business to let someone just work all the time, you know, work for us for a few weeks for free. Uh, but he was very helpful. He wound up doing a project on Nike versus Adidas, doing store checks. Um, it was it was great. And so it does. If you do know someone, I I think you know you'll hopefully be pleasantly surprised by how receptive they are to the idea. Um, it, sorry, if no one else has a question, may I go? Uh, actually, we had one person uh, coming up okay, next, so apologies. you can ask right after. Uh, Gabriel, uh, would yeah. you like to um, ask your question? First, thank you for coming to speak to us. Uh, it's been great. Um, I have two, so Nick, Nick, you can go uh, after me, or and then I can. I hope I can do another one after. Um, so the first one's kind of a general investing question. Um, how concerned are you with upcoming inflation, and what do you think is the best investment strategy to kind of protect yourself? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I do think, I mean, if you look at the amount of money that's been printed just in the last 12 months, the money supply has increased by something like 12 to 30%, depending on how many months you look back. It's real. it's, it's, it's a particularly staggering amount. Um, People worry during periods of time. So coming out of the financial crisis in 2008, there was definitely a real concern about, you know, there was so much as, in order to pull the economy out from the impact of the financial crisis in 2008. Again, the, the Fed did similar things, not on the, not at the magnitude of um, the pan, of the COVID pandemic, but where they increased the money supply double digits. And there was a fear of inflation, which never proved out because unemployment was hit so hard that it took years um, for, there was enough slack in the economy that, no, that the money printing didn't cause runway inflation. I think this time is a little different because um, all of the legislation that's been put in place the stimulus payments, the increases to unemployment, um, people, the kind of average income to uh, for unemployment and stimulus, which only lasts for a few months, is higher than the average job. And so you are seeing, so you don't have that same slack in the economy that you had during the financial crisis. And so I, I do believe we are going to see that the increase you're seeing in interest rates is the right prognosticator of the inflation we will see in the economy. And so there's different ways to people in general invest when they're worried about inflation. Um, if you're really extremely worried, so the US dollar has devalued about 5% in the last year, if you're really worried about, you know, that you have no faith in the government, that, that we don't have confidence in the government being responsible fiscally and pulling back some of the stimulus over time and kind of having tightening policies to offset the stimulative policies that we've seen. Uh, there's inflation hedges like gold. Um, some people would argue Bitcoin accomplishes the same thing in that they're assets that have very low supply growth. Gold supply growth only grows about 1.3% a year. Bitcoin even a little less now because only 21 million Bitcoin can ever be created. And so at the extreme, the way you would protect if you were worried about inflation would be infl traditional inflation hedges, which are assets that have li very limited supply growth. You can't just print gold. Um, that's one way. Another way would be to invest in investments that 
benefit from inflation. And so that's generally assets with a lot of pricing power. Um, hotels uh, is a good example that people believe in. Um, another example would be companies that make money when interest rates go up. Banks are the classic example because banks pay you money when you, when you keep your money in a bank, they pay you money and then they lend out the money at a higher interest rate. And so as interest rates go up, they can lend at higher rate. They're, the spread that they make improves.